we move along now by going back to Warren because he emailed me uh, one evening <laughs> earlier this week telling me about a very unique ad that I hadn't seen, but he had just spotted. It's in the campaign for governor on Utah. And this one, it's a commercial, features both candidates, Republican Spencer Cox and Democrat Chris Peterson. Uh, and the interesting thing is they're not blasting each other. It's quite the contrary. Uh, Warren, uh, tell us a little bit more and then introduce it and we'll roll it. It's only 30 seconds. Well, I think it just speaks for itself. And as you say, it does have a Democrat and a Republican in it. Uh, the question that you come up with at the end is, why do they do this? <laughs> I'm Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. We are currently in the final days of campaigning against each other to be your next governor. And while I think you should vote for me. Yeah, but, but really you should vote for me. There are some things we both agree on. We can debate issues without degrading each other's character. We can disagree without hating each other. And win or lose in Utah, we work together. So let's show the country that there's a better way. My name's Chris Peterson. And I'm Spencer Cox. And we, we approve, approve this message. Warren, let's start with you, of course. Well, <laughs> I think it's a wonderful spot, and it speaks for itself in terms of uh, being fed up with the back and forth of political campaigns. But on the other hand, I got to thinking about it after I suggested we run it. It doesn't tell you anything. Neither of them has, gives you any idea of why uh, he should be better than the other guy. And, I, and, and if you remove the uh, back and forth from the politics, it seems to me, you take the politics out of politics. So, yeah, I think it's an interesting complaint, but that's about all it is. You sort of shrugged your head there, Sherry. What's your thought? Well, I I'm, I'm very sorry that you said it takes politics out of politics. It's a different kind of politics. It's in some ways, it's what politics used to be back in the day, as they say. I mean, politics are necessary to create policy. Compromise used to be the currency of politics. Being able to cross party lines, being able to talk to one another and get a similar message out. No more. I mean, look what's going on on the Hill right now. I, I'm, you know, God love them for putting that out. I hope it makes all yeah. of us feel guilty is what I hope. Yeah, you know, you know, Sherry, in a way, it, I think that it's a, a repudiation of President Trump's politics, to be sure. honest with you. And, and the Agreed. interesting thing is it came in, in Utah, which is such a strong Republican state. Trump is ahead. You're absolutely right, David. Trump, it's a, it, Trump is leading in the polls in Utah. Does anybody know how the, the, the polling is going for a uh, governor? I'd love to know whether <laughs> it's a close race or a done deal. Because that will influence the way I look. That's at a this good ad. question. Uh, maybe one of you, while we're uh, doing uh, as we somebody who we has their phone, look at real clear politics. Have a look at that for us. Five thirty-eight. One of the two. Yeah. 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 That 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 would be great. Uh, I for those of you who are waiting for us to get to your questions, we're going to do it. We have one more short little thing, and that's about Facebook ads. The Washington Post reported last week a big surge in them during the final two months of the campaign. Here's an example for you. It's uh, Trump and Biden ads side by side. Trump's spending nearly $800,000 a day on these ads in battleground states. Biden spending well over $600,000 a day. Remember, we're talking Facebook ads. Their advantage targeting, of course, specific groups about issues that affect them, especially seniors. Uh, let's quickly comment on that. And then we're going to go to our, uh, our, our a couple of uh, hot topics. And then I, I really want to get to our uh, our listeners here and viewers. Uh, Sherry, start us off. What would you like me to say? I mean, <laughs> it doesn't surprise me that, uh, that, that, that this is so different. Um, and it's probably what is echoing through the campaign. Biden has been talking policy and Trump has basically been talking fear. And this is just another way to articulate it to a different group of voters. And I'm really not so sure that, first of all, that there are going to be a whole lot of seniors on Facebook, more likely than on Instagram or TikTok. But nonetheless, it, it seems to me that these are not going to be so effective. And not only that, I think that they are as, as much to scare the other campaign into thinking they're doing more than to get a message 
out to a significant group of Anybody cons- else on social media ads this time around, the effectiveness or lack of it? <laughs> okay, uh, let's move on. And Steve Skutsky, I'm not skipping over your hot topics, but we are going to hear from some of our viewers and listeners who have been extremely patient. And I've got Joel here with the first one who, uh, and Steve, who's, uh, sorry, Joel, who's it from? This is from uh, Steve Rodriguez. He says, uh, maybe it's time to switch from the electoral college to a popular vote. What does the panel think? Okay. Well, that's going to take the subject. That's going to take a lot of work, a lot of work on that because it's a, it's in the constitution, which means a constitutional amendment. It means three quarters of the states. It means two thirds, I believe of both the house and the Senate. So it's an interesting top. It's an interesting concept, but the practical reality of removing the electoral college from our, our process is daunting and significant. Exactly. Any, any, any thoughts on that? I would just say I just, the structure of the, 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 the amendment process. Shall oh, continue with it? Sorry, Warren. I didn't mean to. I was just going to say uh, the structure of the process is such that it favors the states that have lower populations. Yes. And uh, consequently, the prospect of getting a constitutional amendment in that area is absolutely nil, it seems to me. Uh, Dave, do you see it ever happening? No, I, I don't. I, I, I agree with what Warren said. Um, and, and, and I do think that it was a, uh, our forefathers, uh, you know, made some concessions um, to bring, uh, bring other states in uh, to, to the country. And um, I, I don't think it's going to change because I just think the numbers, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, the numbers are too steep. I don't, I don't, I don't think there are enough states that are going to go. I think it. we can kind of all agree to that. Yeah. Um, Joel, I think we've had a text just come in a few minutes ago from Linda Deutsch. What does she say? Yes. She w- wants the panel to talk about what they think of Beverly Hills closing its streets during uh, the election because of possible violence. I saw the, uh, the news coverage of that and I cringed. I have to say that I cringe. It, it, it reminded me of the, the tape of the protests after George Floyd's killing. This is, I mean, really Beverly Hills, Rodeo Drive, California. I'm sorry, there could have been actions taken, protections done that didn't blast out, you know, this is not what we do in America. Board up, free protests, which will only encourage protests. Lock businesses away who are already suffering because of the decrease of business that they're doing because of the pandemic. Renting private security? Yeah. Everybody screamed and yelled when it was made known that there was private security at the time the president walked the gamut in uh, Lafayette Park. I just find it, I found my breath stopped, quite frankly. There, there are better ways to deal with the possibility. And quite frankly, I do think that the possibility is real of civil disturbance during the electoral uh, season. But the panel is responding to a text from Linda Deutsch, who wonders about the uh, decision in Beverly Hills to close down streets in fear of civil violence as a result of the election. Somebody else want to chime in on that? Well, that's the, the great unknown of this election is how long it will take to uh, count votes. Uh, will the vote count? Will people believe the vote count? Will people believe uh, the announced winner? And if they're, if they doubt it, uh, will that touch off? Will that touch off? Uh, I may say that use the uh, use the word rioting. Uh, will that will that will things get out of control? Uh, we don't know all of that. You know, we we're talking about it a lot. Uh, we've Sherry and I have been discussing, worrying about this on her podcast for for weeks. But on the other hand, maybe nothing will happen. Maybe it'll be a uh, Biden landslide and Trump will 
graciously uh, leave, slink <laughs> off into the wherever. I have I've a book I want to sell you too. <laughs> uh, we'll move along. Uh, again, we're going to go back to Joel, who has another email from somebody who was good enough to write to us on newsgeezers2020 at gmail.com. Joel. Uh, this one is from uh, Lou Irwin, who writes, the president has denounced the news media as the enemy, and polls indicate that he has successfully undermined their established impartiality in the minds of tens of millions of Americans. Every American newspaper daily except two have endorsed Biden for president, which could be seen as evidence of the media's bias. How can confidence in their veracity and objectivity be restored? Ah, great question. And Lou, thanks for watching. Uh, love, love to go around the panel on this one. And uh, uh, Dan, let's start with you. Well, I've spent some time wrestling with that subject. And honestly, it's going to take a while. I think the, uh, the general view of people who read the newspaper or watch television is that there is bias and it's not in necessarily in favor of them. At least on the editorial side, there's bias. I would argue that generally the reporters writing the stories, the men and women who are out in the field, I doubt that there's much bias there just because it's not our job, you know, to have to be biased. The job is to be as fair and even handed as possible. And I know that you guys all follow that because I know each of you and I've seen the, the things you do. Um, and and you, you're honest people. I mean, what can I say? I, you know, I'm proud to know you all. Oh, Jerry, especially. Oh, we're talking about the role of the news media here in this uh, very highly partisan election year. And I guess it comes down to what's real news and what's fake news. Uh, let's continue going around. Uh, Warren, do you have a thought on this? Yeah, if you watch uh, cable news and you watch Fox News as opposed to MSNBC, for example, and even CNN to some extent, it appears to me that you're looking at the different party uh, preferences without any doubt whatsoever. Uh, how anybody could say uh, that either side is being, uh, you know, fair and balanced, uh, to use the famous phrase, uh, it, it escapes me. Uh, uh, it seems to me that they have, uh, in fact, adopted the positions of the two parties. That may not be true of all media, but it's certainly true there. Yeah. And, and Warren, if I, if I can follow up on what you're saying, because I, I totally, absolutely agree with, with that, that point. Part of that, I think, is the media's fault, because there is no, there's no clear, to me, uh, no clear difference that's being made by these uh, cable channels uh, between commentary and news. And uh, I think that's, that's really been missing. And I don't think people really necessarily, when they turn on the TV to the, the the cable channels you were talking about, um, I think people just assume that this is the news that's being presented to them, e even if it's not. It, it's, it's, it's commentary. But I think, I think the line there has been broken, um, and I, I think that's a really serious problem, and I think it will be very difficult now to, to change that. Let me bring up a, uh, I'm sorry, Sherry, you had one thing to add here. I, yeah, well, actually, it's, a, it's again, more in the form of a question. You guys are really causing my brain to explode today. <laughs> but where does local news fit in in all of this? Do they have the same problem? Do they have the problem of not even caring about politics? What do people, I mean, the, the, the polls that I have seen indicate that, um, the, that Americans get their news mostly either from the web or, or from local news, that local news is very important to them. And yet we don't see anything about politics except for Dave on the, <laughs> on the local TV no, news. Where does local news fit in given all of our criticisms of the media's bias one way or another? Or when it comes to national politics, when it comes to national politics, it fits in by running commercials. We talk about 
<laughs> so that's you know, so they're not biased. They'll take anybody's money, sure, right? Sherry brought up local ads. We should let uh, Bill chime. I'm sorry, uh, Jim chime in on this. He's news director of uh, three stations. For those of you who weren't here for the introductions, oh, news per se. Barbara, uh, Santa Maria, and San Luis Obispo. Uh, how would you reply to that one, Jim? So the the quick answer is that in local news, what you're seeing certainly in our market is that there are there's ongoing coverage of all of the different prominent local races. Uh, so for example, we have put together at my group of, uh, in my news department, more than 18 to 20 different stories on different races. And that's everything. We have one congressman pretty much for our coverage area. So one one profile on the Republican, one profile on the Democrat. Uh, we have several smaller uh, mayoral races in our coverage area. We have several council races. We have a few school board races. So we're covering all of those types of things. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I think this is a, so there is politics being covered in, in, the lo in local news. I can't speak to Los Angeles because I don't get to see it, but here, it's certainly being covered and we're certainly taking content from our network feeds as far as, you know, what did Biden do today? What did the president do today? That sort of thing. And putting that in our coverage. Uh, but we are very much, you know, we are literally just one click down from MSNBC or Fox news. Mm -hmm. So we're on the same, we're on the same uh, medium that as Dave was mm -hmm. saying, where we have, these uh, these commentary programs that have become the most popular parts of CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, and so because of that, you have uh, you know an audience that's somewhat become programmed to think that everything is from a perspective in that case, which it really isn't. Right. The other thing I think, and this is another challenge I think we face in our industry, is that we now, as because of uh, digital content and because of digital journalism, we have more people who are becoming interested in younger folks who are starting to come into the industry who are interested in advocacy journalism, mm -hmm. all right? W most of us, I think, come from that and relatively modern, you know, like 20th century of impartial journalism. We were trained and raised in that ecosystem of, hey, if you're a reporter, it's not your opinion. It's about trying to show different sides and different pieces of, right. of, a, of an issue. But right. that is not necessarily as much of what people are looking for today. They're looking for the things that they can agree with and that make them feel better. Because at the end of the day, it really is about an emotional connection. I've always believed the best, uh, the best local television content connects with its audience. And so we try to continue to keep it as balanced, as fair, uh, as equal as it possibly can be. We did a, a, a congressional debate on Zoom because our congressman tested positive for COVID. And so he was isolating in Washington, D.C. and could not be here for an in-person debate. So we did it on Zoom. So the two candidates were basically responsible for their own video setup. And at the end of it, both of them thanked us for what we did and seemed to be happy with the way we did it and the format we used and the questions and everything. Uh, we got a, a, a viewer who wrote in and was complaining about the Republican candidate and how he was, how he appeared. And we had to explain to that viewer, well, that person mm -hmm. set up their own signal. Mm -hmm. We weren't a part of that. So we weren't doing anything to make one of them look better than the other. They were both on Zoom. And then the viewer went, oh, okay. And, you know, it was fine. Certainly but it, that disclaimer. those are the kinds of things that we deal with. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to uh, drop in a question now from Steve Skutsky. Uh, Steve gave me some talking points here, and they're all good ones. And a couple of them we've already covered. But this one we have not, and I think it's good. Uh, and then we'll get back to a, uh, a couple of... Uh, viewer emails to newsgeezers2020 at gmail.com and then wrap it up for today. This question comes from Steve. What is the impact of Black Lives Matter protests and clashes? According to a Pew Research poll a month ago, half of white Democrats say they strongly support the Black Lives Matter movement. Just 2% of white Republicans said the same. With Donald Trump fashioning himself as the law and order candidate, what sort of influence has all of this had on the election? Bill, let me start with you. It's had a tremendous influence uh, 
on um, media organizations uh, influencing the way uh, uh, reporters and editors approach stories. Uh, somebody, somebody said uh, was talking about advocacy journalism, and today's journalists are advocates rather than journalists. I disagree with that. I think that uh, today's journalists. I wouldn't call it advocacy journalism. I'd call it putting it in perspective, putting in history and all of that. The Black Lives Movement has sparked uh, rebellions, trauma, uh, meetings, caucuses, chest beatings, uh, people suddenly leaving their jobs, uh, wanting to spend more time with their families, as they say, shakeups, because of uh, the fact that uh, there has been uh, this long, long uh, feel, years of feeling that among uh, African American, among uh, uh, Latino and among Asian uh, reporters that their perspective has not been uh, respected in the newspaper. And as a long time uh, uh, reporter and uh, news executive of, of the biggest newspaper, I have to say that's true. So the impact of black lives has been traumatic, uh, changing and a good thing. And Bill, don't you think that's especially true at the LA Times where you worked? I mean, they did an entire page, a front section of the paper uh, about, you know, the problems that they now acknowledged uh, that they're, they're working to change, right? I thought that, uh, I thought that uh, the long story and the stories that followed uh, were, were very good and, and very true. And as somebody who was there, you know, as a reporter and as a bureau chief and city editor during those years and watch this go on. And, uh, you know, I was involved in, uh, in, in fighting uh, what I considered a racist attitude by uh, some of the editors. Uh, I thought that that was, that was good. You know, it was, yeah. it was chest beating carried to the extreme, maybe, uh, but uh, <laughs> it made them feel better. Good. It was pretty harsh. It was. Yeah. It was. It was dirty laundry on the front page. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it is. It is. It is one of the most uh, important institutions in our community. Yes. Um, and uh, what this institution was doing was examining itself, just like uh, you know, it would be. It would have been a real good thing for City Hall to examine itself uh, mm -hmm. rather than have the uh, federal government have to step in and indict a councilman. So this, that's what this was. It was self-examination to the extreme. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's um, recap what the question was here, or what the topic is, and that's about Black Lives Matter and the effect and the influence <laughs> that it's having on this campaign. A couple of other thoughts. Well, I just want to make it. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to mention that um, the support, particularly among uh, white voters for Black Lives Matter, has actually decreased. That 50 plus percent is a nice percentage, but it is nowhere near what it was during the summer. And that tells you something about um, where that might impact the election. I, I think that I, I agree that the major impact has been um, the organizational impact on people of color, the thinking that's going on because of what Black Lives Matter has done and the questions that the movement has brought up. Um, I just don't know whether it, it it seems to me, quite frankly, overall, after all we've discussed, that the one influence that's going to have any real meaning at all is the pandemic and the handling of coronavirus. The China stuff, bah. Black Lives Matter, it's there and it will influence some people, but it's the pandemic 
that is driving things. And the question is, will it drive turnout? Will Black Lives Matter drive turnout? And if they do, who turns out? And that's what will decide the election. Anybody else on that? Uh, we'll move on to two uh, final uh, emails here. All right, Joel, it's your turn. We're going to do a couple more emails, and then we'll uh, do a uh, do a wrap up. Uh, and again, you're watching the News Geezers virtual political lunch that should have been in person, but all of these panelists will be back in May, or no, I shouldn't say May; they'll be back sometime, whenever we can. All <laughs> yeah. Not picking a date. That's what it's supposed to be. That's why I said May. It was supposed <laughs> to be in May of this year, but now we're doing it in October. And uh, with these six uh, just excellent panelists. And there's another question. Who's it come from, Joel? This is from uh, Arnie Friedman, who identifies himself as a nonpartisan voter. I would like to hear your thoughts about how to deter what might amount to a hijacking of the election if the presidential vote is close and the count takes at least several days to know the results. In addition, if such a delay occurs, how can the vote be decided by the voters rather than by the Supreme Court, which is likely to be stacked by then, with no assurance that the probable newest member will recuse herself from a suit to invalidate the election results. Arnie Friedman, thank you. Uh, we went to university together a couple of years ago. It's uh, nice to have you watching. Uh, uh, who wants to start this one off? It's a great topic. I think Dave should, because he spent 36 days in Florida. Okay. In the year 2000. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah the last time. In a month. Yeah, I, I think this is a slightly different situation, but uh, but thank you for calling on me. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I look. I mean, actually, just sitting here and listening to the description of the question, it, I mean, it was pretty. It's pretty grim, and uh, unfortunately, I, I you know, I don't I don't have an answer for it. I mean, I. Uh, I, I think it's definitely a possibility, all the things that were mentioned in that question. And uh, I, I, I sure hope that doesn't happen, but I, I think there's a pretty reasonable chance that it, that it very well might, uh, might happen. And I don't know, I, I don't know, it's, it's so hard to know how it, specifically it's going to develop and what it's going to take uh, to clear things up. Uh, Jim? My answer to the question is, is that what we do is to do our job, to provide information clearly, accurately, calmly, and to do it in a way that the viewer does not get agitated. The viewer may listen to what they hear and then make their decision on whether they are not, they're happy or not with what's happening. But what we can do is what journalists are supposed to do, which is inform, and to provide information and to do it as clearly and as succinctly and without hyperbole as we can. I think that's really what we can do and what we must do. Ken Blackburn, you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, I just want to mention uh, the LA Times did a very good story. Uh, not that they aren't all good, but um, in this particular case, I thought it was somewhat worrisome. And that is that it reported that nationwide, the sale of firearms has spiked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has gone right through the roof. Um, and that bothers me. Not that I'm anti-firearm, you know, bit Midwestern guy, grew up with them all, over, all around me. But um, if sales of firearms are going up at the rate that the Times story suggested, there's got to be some concern behind that. I mean, a lot of people running around with guns that they nine out of ten probably don't know how to use properly is is concerning. Joel, this is from Ivor Davis, who wants to know uh, or your, hear your comments. At this stage, haven't the voters already made up their minds? We watch these debates, and I was watching that one the other night, and I kept thinking, how many people are going to be swayed by it who haven't already made up their minds? stand on the side with you. something. It, they're very, a very small percentage, but if this election is decided on the margins, that 6% can become very meaningful. Uh, can we continue that uh, that topic, uh, Warren? Well, I think what Arnie laid out was the nightmare scenario that we all are girding our loins against and hoping won't happen. Um, my concern would be, and this goes back to the Black Lives Matter thing to a certain extent, is I don't know how much uh, re backfiring there's going to be 
uh, to that movement, which I find very positive as well. I agree with everything that Bill said about it. I think it's been very positive on our profession as well as on the society in general. We're finally recognizing and taking seriously uh, the kind of repression and suppression that's gone on for so many years when it comes to uh, people of color, particularly uh, black people going all the way back to the era of slavery. But um, there's a lot of racism in the uh, country as well. And to what extent that will emerge as uh, part of the, uh, the uh, electoral result, I don't think we know. I, I think it's doubtful that people tell polls, pollsters uh, if they have that kind of sentiment. Um, I, and I, it's one of the uncertainties that I think uh, hovers over us. Uh, and uh, I agree with regard to the uh, plethora of guns, whether you grew up with them or not, uh, we got too many of them. Anybody else with a thought on that one? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Dave, please. You know, I, I, I think this election in, in many respects is a referendum on President Donald Trump and, and a referendum on the coronavirus and, and how it's been handled. Um, and I think, I think for, for those reasons, I mean, there's sort of the 800, you know, the 800 pound gorillas in the room. Um, I, I, think, I think most people, I would venture to say almost everyone uh, has made up their mind. I think the question now for the campaigns and the candidates is getting out their voters and getting them to get to the polls or, or to mail in a ballot. Um, I, 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 think, I think just about everyone has or knows their choice at this point. It's just a matter of whether they're gonna follow through in, in large, to a large extent, I think. Anybody else for that? Well, I agree I with Dave you. Dave set, set it up very well. Yeah. 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 Every election always comes down to turnout. Period. Well, that's the question that's of finding last line of the plot. Um, what happened to uh, with us? Trump, uh, what happened four years ago was at the very end. Uh, there was this movement toward Trump that was not uh, detected by uh, yeah. pollsters or or anyone else, and. Uh, and we really don't know uh, what's going to happen in in that last week. It's. Do you mind if I just hit a one off for all of you? Very quick answer here, uh, just as succinct as you can make it. What happens on November 3rd and in the immediate following days? In other words, what I'm asking is who wins by how much? How soon will we know? Make it very quick. Let me start with Dave. Ha. I, I think uh, I think Biden wins uh, based on what we're seeing right now. I, I wouldn't bet any large amounts of money on either one, but um, I uh, and then I think you know we'll see we'll see by how much, but I I, I think he wins. Warren, I think uh, Biden probably wins. I'd be concerned about uh, the state by state. A situation. I think that in uh, some states the results may be very close uh, and could lead to uh, challenges of various kinds. I think the uh, Trump administration yeah. is looking, or the Trump campaign, perhaps the administration as well, certainly the Justice Department, uh, is looking at ways to uh, upset the outcome. Hey, Bill Boyarski, what happens on November 3rd and immediately after? Never predict, never bet on an election. <laughs> and, uh, not going to change now. Uh, Cherry, what happens November 3rd? I bow to my co-host here. I will <laughs> not predict. I have never predicted. And I am still suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder from 2016. Don't ask. <laughs> Dan Blackburn. Well, you know, uh, I do think uh, Biden's probably going to narrowly win. But beyond that, I'm sticking with my friends, Bill and Sherry. Huh? No predictions beyond that. And Jim Lemon? I'm a big fan of the 538 website and Nate Silver. Okay. And so I'm a big believer in trying to get as much empirical data. Uh, I think it's either going to be a significant, clear, delineated win, one way or the other, or it's going to become, or it's going to be very close, and then it's going to become a protracted struggle for several weeks 538 is saying uh 9.2 percent this morning for uh that's biden's margin as the margin yeah 
Yeah, as a margin, real clear politics down about a percent from that. Yeah, right. uh, I mean, I kind of see these uh, these these numbers kind of uh, narrowing a little bit in yeah. the week before the third. We certainly saw that in 2016. Warren, what's your thought? Well, I I think that uh, as I've already said, I I, uh, I agree that that uh, it's likely that Biden will do well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what what question you're asking is different. From no, no, I, I was asking, do you, do you think that uh, I should have rephrased that better? Do you think that the poll numbers uh, can be expected to tighten between now and the third? I suppose that that's probably true. I, uh, I also sympathize with uh, Bill and Sherry and the idea that it's pretty hard to predict anything, uh, particularly this close uh, to the election. Not that it's easier when it's further out. But um, yeah, I think that they'll get closer. Um, but again, I've, I'm not entirely persuaded by the uh, figures, by the figures themselves. And I don't think the national figures mean anything. Exactly. Thank you to all six of you. We're going to wrap this up. I'd ask all six of you to stick around uh, as we end the stream after a few closing announcements. Uh, you guys are all terrific. Uh, just thank you to each one of you. Jim Lemon, Dave Bryan, Warren Olney, Sherry Bevis, Jeffy, Dan Blackburn and Bill Boyarski couldn't ask for a better team to do this with. They're all going to come back. They promised uh, sometime in 2021. Uh, we don't know yet when, but it'll be a in-person panel. And that's why I threw up a bunch of dates here because we just, <laughs> it is, but keep watching newsgazers.com and your, uh, an email inbox near you. And I'll let you know when I know. Next year, we'll bring also an in-person program featuring Lou Irwin, who was nice enough to write in today, the original KABC TV anchor, then news director at a number of Los Angeles radio stations. Truly someone, as it says up there, who's lived a lifetime of news. And Steve Bender is Channel 7 producer and uh, director back then, who went on to produce and direct a lot of memorable network and syndicated television programs. Steve Skutsky, what a champ of the videos. He's got some other very well-produced videos already ready for that program. The only lunch we succeeded in having this year was on February 29th. It featured the history of the Los Angeles News Choppers and the videos. You will see links. I think it's in three parts, if I remember, on uh, newsgazers.com. The links are right there. Uh, it was a really enjoyable program. And if you go to newsgazers.com, there's the website. And you will see the links there in the right-hand column. Again, my thanks to all the panelists. And without Steve Skutsky, Joel Tater, and Bill Dawson, this would not have happened. And more importantly, to all of you who joined us today from near and far, have a wonderful, safe holiday season. And may 2021 bring happiness and good health to any, everyone that is watching. Thank you hey, all. Hey, Bob, when, when we come back next year, are you going to be throwing our statements from tonight on us? Uh, of about course. What we were predicting? Of course. Why do you think we recorded this? <laughs> <laughs>